It's the next level. Hey, panelers, welcome to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this week we're doing uh, Daredevil Season 3, Episodes 7 and 8. So the synopsis for Daredevil Season 3, Episode 7, which is entitled Aftermath, is the press crucifies Daredevil after the attack on the Bulletin, and Agent Nadim suspects the FBI paid too high a price for Fisk's cooperation. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, Nadim is starting to starting to put things together that that they may have. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's coming that. around and understanding yeah. what's going on and realizing what Fisk's up to and to some degree. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, want me to go ahead and start? Yeah, we'll get to our top fives. I'm Daredevil. And you start. Okay. Uh, yeah, that painting, it threw me off. Like the first time I watched the episode, I didn't really note it. But then the second time when it started and, he, and Fisk is talking about that painting and the lawyer guy says, oh, rabbit in a snowstorm, you mean? And they have this whole conversation about this painting that Fisk is supposed to get to hang in the hotel suite. And he's like, I'm supposed to get all my stuff. And, and he's like, well, there's some questions of ownership and, and all this. But then it's never mentioned again the rest of the episode and even at the end when the deem you know comes into the hotel suite he looks down and you can see him looking at that empty spot on the wall so i i didn't that it just was a little weird that they they made a point to talk about this this painting and the lawyer says there's some thing about the ownership and is he's like we can use it to get leverage for something else and fisk just insists huh. no no we have to get the, i have to have this painting Maybe this is something that's going to come later on and in a future episode. I guess. I'm, I mean, we've got five episodes left, so, you know, five, it, six episodes it left. It has so. to be. <laughs> it has to be something I, that's important if they're just going to throw this in. This is not casual conversation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I found it interesting, too, when I saw what you wrote, and I'm like, i got to go back and watch. <laughs> and I looked, and I'm like... Because yeah, that's literally, that's the only mention of it in both of these episodes, is just that few minutes there at the beginning of episode seven, and then they never bring it up again. <laughs> and I'm like, what What was the point of that? So, <laughs> I'm hoping there's, there's got to be a point down the road. There so. has to be. Yeah. Uh, my number five would be uh, Fisk's little, quote-unquote, bat cave he has in the basement. Apparently, he has someone there working for him as well and sees all the footage that it, quote-unquote, the daredevil at that attacked but uh he's also monitoring everything else that's going on and around the complex as well yeah this was actually my number four so it, it's it really goes right into that and mrs shelby was what he called that woman who was down there and it's that whole media room really seems weird you know it, it's it's a He's got all the monitors where he can he can watch the FBI agents. So there's obviously there's a camera in the FBI agents, like their little room yeah. where they're watching him. And then there's another bank, you know, of monitors there where he tells her to put the news footage up like you like you talked about. And it just it, it was really weird. And, you know, Nadim there at the end almost catches him. But obviously he sees Nadim coming. And so he he gets into the bed. He gets, you know, comes upstairs and gets in bed real quick to make it look like he's been in bed the whole time. Yeah, it's really strange. Makes me think that Fisk is actually using the FBI's monitors or has Shelby tapping into their cameras as well. You yeah. Know? And I think we're. You know, we see more of this in the next episode, even, where he's got even access to even more surveillance. Yeah, he does. And, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. It's like him trying to recapture his throne, in a sense. Because if you saw when he's going through the closet and stroking all the white, <laughs> you know, <laughs> suit jackets, uh, mm -hmm. are they silk or something? Because they look so sheen and everything. Yeah, and shiny. I don't know. Yeah, and then on top of that, and then he goes down. He always wears the same outfit, apparently. 
Mm-hmm. I guess he thinks of himself almost like an Einstein because Einstein used to wear the same thing every day. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so that was my number four. So I guess that brings us to your number four. My number four would be the conversation with Sister Maggie and Matt while she stitches him up. You know, for the longest time, you know, she's been trying to help him, but realizes that the advice that she gave about, you know, having his friends help out and get involved was pretty much a mistake. And she felt bad and guilty about that in some respects. Yeah, and that was, an, you know, it's interesting. These these two episodes, especially, I think they highlight Matt's kind of not just weakness, but his kind of uh, self. Uh, what's the word I'm searching for? Like, like he he seems very down on himself. Yeah, like he, he's he's talking about how how this guy is faster than him and he can't beat him and and all this and and she's just like you're you need to let me stitch you up because you're bleeding all over everything and and he's all. You know, he's all worried about uh, Foggy and Karen. He's like, this guy could have killed them. And, and it just, it was very self, uh, a lot of anxiety, kind of self-conscious about his own choices. Yeah, and, he's being f- self-absorbed about everything that's going on and feels, you know, like he's to blame. And he's still trying and trying. And I think that's why we get uh, more of, like, kind of like what, what we talked about in the past about Fisk coming into his head. Yeah, talking him yeah. down and mm-hmm. and it's I, I think it's Matt using Fisk in his own mind to push himself down even though he continues the fight to do what he feels is right. Yeah, and I've got some more about this in the next episode as well because that's where we see it. Yeah. So, cool. So that brings us to my number three. Correct. I thought it was interesting that Nadim, when he brings the warden in and he's, he's kind of questioning him about what happened with, with Jasper Evans and the warden gets real defensive about it and finally says, you know, that he's, he's going to call his lawyer. And so we see, like we talked about at the beginning, that Nadim is starting to get this idea. There's something more here with Fisk that, that Fisk may be playing them for fools. And when he brings that up to his boss, it was interesting because I still suspect that his boss is the one who's, uh, who's giving information to Fisk, but maybe not. Maybe it is her boss. I'm not sure, but, uh, he, he, you know, he tries to tell her to, you know, he's, she starts to call her boss and he stops her and he goes, no, no, give me 24 hours or give me two days. I think is what actually what he said. Give me two days to figure out what's going on. And she's like, do you want a pony too? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so I thought it was really, really interesting. If she is the one who's the leak that she's and maybe not, maybe she was, maybe she's not the one who's the leak. So maybe it was, it was real truthful what she was doing. I don't know. I'm, I'm still on the fence about her. Yeah, same here. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's really weird with certain amount of characters that come in into mm-hmm. the episode, and you're like, mm-hmm. where are they? Where are they functioning in this? And you don't know exactly where the role is, and it makes you doubt what's going on within the show itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that would lead me to my number three, which would be, uh, well, Karen and Foggy talking to Nadim and Karen basically making it clear that it wasn't Daredevil, you know, during that little uh, conversation with Nadim. Uh, It was pretty much an intense scene, but something that was pretty much needed based on what happened in the last episode. And you could see Karen how, with her conviction of what she was saying, and Foggy even mentions it too, and and Nadim is pretty much, you know, making a joke like, oh, well, you know, how did you know? You only met him twice, and she knew. And it's like, this is not how he reacts. This is not what Daredevil does. And Foggy going around, and, you know, that will drop down to my (laughs) first quote. So we'll actually talk about it. So Foggy basically states, if every fat guy with a white beard wears a red suit, does that mean they are all Santa? And then, you know, Nadim goes, he turns around basically stating, you know, he goes, well, if he puts a bunch of presents underneath my tree, of course, I think he would be Santa. But the thing is, is that with this, in this case, you know, this is outside of what Daredevil normally does. So he's pretty much attacking somebody who's pretty much innocent in in a respect. Yeah. 
Yeah, I had this. I actually had this in my notes. So it's it's interesting that you bring this bring this up because she's you know she's very particular to tell him no, that wasn't actually Daredevil. Yeah, and I think it's interesting we, we find out later. You know, then at the end of the episode when he actually meets Matt and Matt tells him that that wasn't him, that he's Daredevil, that he's the real Daredevil, that he buried the suit, the other guy, you know, had another suit and all that. And so we start to see, again, we start to see that Nadim is is starting to kind of figure this out and starting to know, okay, uh, this is, you know, there's something more here. Yeah, there's more than, there and between these three people too. Yeah. Between yeah. Foggy and Karen, because you could tell that Nadim understood that within that little meeting that they knew something about Daredevil, but they weren't giving that information. Yeah, yeah. And that leads, you know, my number two is is just the, the fact that, that Matt, Sister Maggie, says something about, you know, she's the one that kind of tells him, because, well, where did you get the suit? And how good, how good was the suit? And he goes, well, it was perfect. It was exactly like my suit. And so she's like, well, he can't just go buy that at Walmart. <laughs> you know, that's not, you can't just go, you know, pluck that out of a costume shop. Yeah. And so that's when he realizes and he goes and he finds Melvin, the suit suit maker and then you know he leads him to his new shop because it was inter- that was a whole interesting kind of back and forth between them because he says that he burned down his shop but then fisk uh, built him a new one and matt says well take me to it and so he goes there and there's another suit there and, and so the guy locks him in and matt realizes the guy has set him up and that the fbi is coming to get him and so they have this fight yeah and the the guy is really i think we talked about this in the first season mm-hmm. or something that the, this guy or the second season whenever he made that suit mm-hmm. for him uh that this guy isn't in the comics this guy is a hero or a villain some sort of yeah he actually the, the character of melvin potter is mm-hmm. actually a villain and he was a suit maker Right. Uh, that was a little bit of like information, uh, uh, additional notes that I had. So basically, he was a suit maker, and he was the character or f- like a major villain for Daredevil in the comics, which was called Gladiator. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, because he fights. I mean, he he fights, and he 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 gets he gets some licks in. Yeah, on he Matt knows how and, to fight. Yeah, and that's something that that I've really picked up on this season, especially as we've seen Matt. Get beat up a bit yeah. in this, you know. And I, I know he's been weakened. Well, he's also the, got stabbed, and he's got yeah, stitches no, that's what I'm and saying. everything else. So he was kind of weakened in that state, and I think that's why how Melvin got over him. Now, mind yeah, you, that's, that's what I'm saying. Is, yeah. Is, now, mind is, you, in the comic, s- he uh, Melvin Melvin Potter, who is Gladiator, has like like almost like superhuman powers. So in this, they okay. just made him a regular guy who's just a suit maker, which made sense yeah. for what they're doing within the Netflix series to make it more realistic in a sense. And yeah. uh, I really like that. And that would be my number two as well, going into my number two, which would be Melvin with Matt and, you know, setting up Matt with the FBI. But that mm-hmm. fight was pretty intense. And what, you know, Matt was doing, like he basically takes the... uh the saw blade and throws it and he's able to do all these things to get away from the FBI at that point. Yeah. And I thought that was interesting that when, after Melvin gets arrested, that the the lawyer guy kind of comes to Fisk and tells him that Potter has been arrested and Fisk's like, well, he's irrelevant now. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, which that leads to a whole nother thing that we see in this episode or is it in the next, or is it, is it in my notes? It might be in the next episode, or was it in this one where he goes and, and sees Betsy? Yeah, he, in the that, next episode, he sees. That's the next episode. Okay, Betsy, yeah. so this this is the one. This is the the episode that actually ends with, which is my number one, which is Matt having that vision of Fisk and kind of telling him that, hey, you left you left a simpleton to get uh, arrested by the FBI, and you just slinked away, and it's kind of this whole thing of of kind of playing on his inadequacies, you know, and. It's it's not actually Fisk there, mm-hmm. but no, it is this episode. It, yeah, is, it is, yeah, this episode. It's the end. Because after that, he goes at the, at the very end. end. He goes and he meets Betsy, and he tells her that she should get out of town. Yep. And she kind of uh, compares Matt to Kingpin to Wilson Fisk. She says, "You guys are both yes. using Melvin for this." And I, I really think it's interesting that we're seeing Matt. You know, like he thinks Melvin's in danger. He thinks Betsy's in danger. But from what we can see, from what actually what 
Wilson Fisk is saying is Wilson Fisk doesn't care about them anymore. No. He's just like, okay, well, I'm done with them. I don't need them anymore. I'm not going to worry about them. And so Matt kind of giving her this warning, it's not necessary. No, it's not. It, it's just him trying to reach out, I think, and him trying to do what he thinks is right. But And plus also to stay in good face in front of people mm-hmm. or in the public eye and thinking that Betsy would do something, I think. And yeah, that, that was my number one as well. You know, it harkens back to what I was saying about Fisk in his head. So mm-hmm. it's basically, it's Fisk telling him in his own head that he is failing at what he's doing, but yet he continues to persist and to do what he needs to do. And he's thinking, all right, I need to tell this woman. And obviously it's weird too, because Betsy didn't even realize that Melvin was picked up and she's a cop. No, she's a parole officer. Oh, she's a parole officer. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Well, and some parole officers have like law enforcement, I guess, because she did. She was wearing a badge. And she did have a gun. So and so Melvin she, had a record, so she had to know. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, but she. It probably was one of those things where since he had just got arrested, she hadn't. They hadn't. Nobody had told her. Yeah. Yeah. She had. He had. You know. But yeah, that's it, that whole. It, it just. I don't know if it's if it's Matt, you know, thinking that these people are in danger, but they're actually not, or I, it just it's a little, it just it was a little much. So yeah, I don't know. Okay, so that was our top fives. We went through those pretty quick. Yeah, <laughs> but you had a few notes too. I we do, and I had one quote that I really liked was when Nadim is talking to Wilson Fisk, and he says, "Your desperation diminishes you, special agent." I thought that was really yeah. he's very precise in the way he speaks. I really like how uh, D'Onofrio is playing this. The character. way he yeah. enunciates is really amazing. It, it has that kind of candor, that that tone to it, that yeah, that harkens or just feels like it's the actual kingpin. Now, mind you, yeah. he's not a big, hulking, large man, but he is a tall, physically large man in real life. Uh, yeah. If you look at the way that Vincent, you know, Vincent D'Onofrio actually portrays him. Yeah, I had a couple of notes here. Uh, I thought it was interesting, the whole story that Nadim tells Wilson Fisk about the Jiggy, the heroin yeah. dealer. And we have that same kind of thing where... Nadim is, is comparing Wilson Fisk to this guy and saying that you just use people the same way this guy was using people. It's a really cool scene. And then we have two two other additional scenes in there that give us kind of glimpses into these characters. We hear Karen call her dad and yeah. she's just – she's crying and her dad just kind of dismisses her on the phone and she, she says something like – you know, I was just trying to do the right thing and it went all wrong. And, and she, and he replies, well, that's what you do. And I just, I just felt so bad for her in that scene because your dad, that's the one person that you should be able to go to. And, and he should be able to be the one to, to pick you up and encourage you and not, you know, not, not like put you down. And that's kind of what he did here. And then he kind of gives her a slap when he, through, not, not literally, literally, but, but slap yeah, to the face. She, yeah. Because she says, can I come home? And he's like, no, it's not the right time, but you can call anytime you want. Oh yeah. I was just like, I was like, man, that's just, Oh yeah. It's just, Uh, it it just hits you in the feels, but she's always had problems. And if you looked in season one, when they, when foggy and Matt first encountered her and Matt took her in and did all that, she had issues and problems. So she redeemed herself, got herself a job, with them and then eventually went into becoming a reporter and everything and did well for herself. And I don't think her family ever acknowledged that or knew about what was going yeah. on. Mm-hmm. So they see it as, Oh, the, you're calling me cause you need something, but I'm always here. But yeah, you know, that it's really sad, but I, I wish they brought, you know, if they had another season, they could actually tap into that and see what she's doing. But obviously we don't, but it would have been nice yeah. to see that, so that way it's like, oh, okay, that's a redeemable quality of mm-hmm. what's going on with Karen's story. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then and then we also get a little glimpse into back into Agent Nadim's kind of home life, and and I, I kind of went back and forth on this conversation with his wife, and I finally settled on that I think it's really sweet that you know she comes to him and she says you lied to me because he had told her that he wasn't uh, in the bulletin building when the attack went down and she found out from one of the other agents wives that he was actually in the building that he actually confronted the yeah. bad guy 
and then lied to her. And she's like, I can't, you can't lie to me anymore. And he's like, okay, from now on that you're, and I really, I really like that. Cause at first it was, it, that could have been a breaking moment with their relationship, but it wasn't, it was a, it was a relationship, a moment that made their relationship stronger. Correct. I feel so. So I really, really liked that kind of sweet moment between them. And then, of course, we get the, we finally get him and Matt meeting face to face. And we already talked a little bit about that, <laughs> about, you know, Matt telling him he's he's dressed in that that original uh, devil of Hell's Kitchen garb, the black, not the yeah, not the actual daredevil suit. And he tells Nadim that he's buried that red suit, but the other guy brought it up and that that guy wasn't him. And then the, he, he says that guy is an FBI agent. And then, and that's going to get into the next episode. Yeah. It turns the gears in the team's head at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to take uh, the synopsis? Sure. So the synopsis for episode eight, the title of upstairs, downstairs is a desperate Dex reaches out for help. Matt forms an uneasy alliance with agent Nadim and Karen concocts a dangerous plan to provoke Fisk. Yeah. <laughs> and no mention of Foggy in there, but okay. Yeah, but Foggy actually did a lot too. In this. I know that's <laughs> like they could have said something about Foggy in there, but I guess they, these synopses are are just real brief. So yeah, I don't know if it was this episode of the last one where he got lucky with his girlfriend, <laughs> and it's just like whoa, that was uncomfortable. And I think Karen. Brought oh it up. yes, it is. <laughs> it, it's 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 funny because it, it happened in episode seven, but he talks about it in episode eight. Yeah, I remember so, that part. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one of my quotes from episode eight because I actually was was paying attention to which episode the quote is actually in, but uh, but the actual moment that he's talking about is in episode seven. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, now on to our top five. I'm Daredevil. And I'll go first. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, Dex running up to Julie and trying to come clean and be a good person in the very beginning of the episode. You actually see it. He's doing the run with her as she normally does in the morning. But I like the plea to her and him being sincere about his intentions. You know, he's just basically trying to reach out with you know, as messed up as he is. And I think she understood that and she saw that and she actually gives that information to him saying, you should really be talking to a therapist about this. So basically he thought a lot of her and wanted to be like her because he really liked her as a person and what she represented and how she helped people. And he thought maybe she could help him, but he also wanted to be like her. So he explains that to her in the coffee shop, which is uh, pretty funny, too, in the end, because, uh, you know, he goes through the whole thing about, you know, about the FBI. She goes, well, what about that? I was like, I kind of screwed that up. (laughs) And then, you know. Yeah. I actually had this in my notes as well was their their little meeting there in the coffee shop because it it shows us some things that we didn't know before. It's really, really cool that we, we see that Dex that there's a part of Dex that really wants to go back to that time with this therapist when he was a good guy, when he yeah. wasn't really doing evil things. And we see that moment when they focus in on the security camera there in the coffee shop and we see that someone is watching them. And then of course, later she comes back and I, I, it took me, I had to, it took me thinking a lot about it and watching it through the second time to realize that she must live in the hotel now as well. Yeah. Because when she comes up to her floor, those same guys that are there at the end with where Wilson's bat little bat cave thing is those guys are the ones that knock her on the head, steal her phone and they hold up the phone to the surveillance camera in the hallway there Mm -hmm. where they are. And then later when Dex tries to text her, you know, from the FBI office, I'm assuming that's going to be, it's either Wilson Fisk or one of the other guys responding to his texts and telling him, leave me alone. Don't call me anymore. And then blocking his number. And so he tries to call and he gets all these things that say your number has been blocked. Yes. And so it's interesting. I I guess we're going to probably find out maybe in the next episode or maybe later we'll find out kind of what happened to her, whether she's still alive, whether they killed her or or what, but yeah, that, that was interesting that we're seeing that Fisk is really in control of more than just the hotel, more than just, he really is manipulating. Like we talked about in the last episode in last week's episode, he's really manipulating decks a lot. Yeah, he is. 
big time. So my number five is finally someone looks at the video <laughs> and reviews the tapes. I was just like, I, and I didn't notice until the second time I watched it that that's how Nadine figures out that Dex is the one who Daredevil is talking about, who Matt is talking about, because we see him watch Dex on the monitor that monitors the FBI guys, yeah. and, he and he sees Dex turn the cameras off. So I was really happy to see that and to, to see this whole thing of that he's working with Matt to try to get this evidence, yeah. and he even sets up – it's really interesting. He sets up that whole meeting for Dex with that lawyer so that while he's busy, they can sneak into Dex's apartment and kind of search it. So it's it's really – it's an interesting level of manipulation there that Agent Nadine has that we've not really seen that before out of him. No. So. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So what was your number four? My number four would be Foggy basically coming to Karen at a certain point, goes to her apartment, and having the theory of Fisk being this, quote-unquote, kingpin of corruption. And then Karen tries to convince him not to go through with it to, you know, for him to expose everything about Fisk. But... You know, I think she's just basically afraid for Foggy and herself. And, you know, he brings the terms of Fisk's uh, incarceration. And, you know, she reviews it and looks at it and saying, well, this could be masked or, you know, this is going to be hard. And you're putting yourself pretty much in somebody's bullseye. And not to quote a phrase, <laughs> but uh, or make a pun. But the fact that, you know, you're putting a target on your head at that point. Yeah, she says something like, "Like you, you can't make a plan because anytime you make a plan, he's going to be two steps ahead, ahead of you. Yeah. He's already he's already thought of whatever your plan is, and he's like, no, he couldn't even see me coming. He wouldn't even know what this is about. And he starts to explain, and it's really kind of cool. This was actually my number four as well. So it's, it's really cool, Foggy kind of figuring out what Wilson Fisk is doing, and he's, he figures out that Wilson Fisk – is getting rid of the competition so that he can figure out who they're bribing and who they're who they're like the Albanians were controlling and now this controls them and, and he figured this out because Marcy was uh defending or was defending this I some IRS guy who was taking kickbacks or or something like that and she and he starts to talk about it and, and Karen stops him and so it's really cool to see that and then of course he tells her well we just write the story we'll go you know come to this endorsement dinner with me it's 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 a debate I can't actually be there as a candidate but because my father's meat business is a contributor to the campaign, I can be there in the crowd and I'm going to, I'm going to bring something up as the right in candidate that he is. And then we get that whole scene there at the dinner with him talking back and forth yeah. to Blake tower again. And that was so good. And, and yeah, so it just really that this whole, this whole thing of foggy figuring this out and he's got it laid out all over the floor yep. of the apartment <laughs> as he's putting it together, you know, and, uh, and then that leads to one of my quotes that we'll get to when we get to our quotes that we already kind of talked about. Uh, yeah, and that would lead me to my number three, which would be uh, Matt and Nadim break into Dex's vault in his apartment and look for the suit. And Matt using his hearing to break into the vault, that was pretty cool. I like that idea. Kind of like a... <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, I forget the name. Like a safe cracker the Italian kind of job, thing, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> What's like, yeah. you know, Charlize Theron. And just yeah. like uh, using yeah. his ears. But in this case, he doesn't really have to be like right on top of it or anything. And he could hear the yeah. tumblers and figure it out. And then he gets into it. And then he <laughs> finds the tape of the therapist in there and he keeps it. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and I, uh, there, I didn't list the quote. I have a quote from there, from that in my, in my note, my quote notes. But, uh, there's also a quote that he said that I almost wrote down that when Nadim asks him about, he says that he can smell the suit. And yeah. Nadim is like, you can smell the suit. And he's like, yeah, GSR and latex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So yeah. he got it. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it was really, really cool. And that's uh, – so that, that really is, is my number three. That goes right into my number three as well, which is that when Dex comes back to the apartment and he's attacking them with those – whatever those glass things were that he took out of that uh, hallway chandelier. Yeah, it was like the little shooting. hanging chandelier pieces. And yeah. he throws them at the very end when he's fighting Matt. At, at a certain point. And he's he's shooting the gun and it, it took me, this was another one of those things that it took me, I had to watch it a couple of times, had to back it up and, and look at it a couple of times, that I realized that he's he was using their reflection in the windows across the street yes. 
to Rick, and then he was shooting the bullets and ricocheting them up the fire escape to where they would go into yeah. the apartment, yeah. the apartment above him. Because Nadim first says, "Oh, he's shooting from across the street," and Daredevil's like, and "Matt's like, no, no, I think he's below us. I think he's ricocheting the bullets." You know, he's in the apartment underneath us, and it's like this is just crazy. This guy, and he, and then he waits for him to to reload. He says, "Let me, I'll know when he runs out of bullets." Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just and really tells cool. him to and run he, at a certain time, and he does, and then he gets away. And then yeah. on top of that, he's on top of Matt at that point with the fire escape and throwing those things like throwing knives almost at directly at Matt. Yeah, and Matt's got that got that lid, whatever that lid was yep. that he was using to deflect him, and he gets up to the roof, and that's when the cops arrive at Dex's apartment, so he can't pursue Matt anymore. Uh, it's just a really, really cool kind of scene, and the, the way they shot it and the way they did it was really... Yeah, uh, really it was cool a really good, intense scene, and it actually points true to what, you know, what Dex is. L literally, he's bullseye. Come on, he's, he's hitting every target. Look at those yeah. obstacles he's using your reflections to, mm -hmm. to shoot at people at this point and his aim yeah, is on target crazy. too yeah, yeah so so it, it yeah, kind of exactly. lives true to the actual comic book of what bullseye was in the sense that we don't get that kind of cheesy costume with the bullseye and everything on it yeah or the 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 colin farrell character with the <laughs> The scar, the scar on his, on his head, yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that leads us to your number two, I believe. Yeah, the, my number two would be uh, you already mentioned it. Foggy's little speech that he makes at the dinner, and he was pushing it with Tower, the guy who's going for the DA position that he's opposing at this point, and he's just like spewing off at the mouth as he <laughs> normally would, but he's just stating how he feels and how yeah, this guy's not going to do anything for you here, and I'm. You know, basically making Tower's credibility look bad for being the next DA. And, you know, and just Foggy just pushing for his running to be the DA, which is great. But then he has to leave right away <laughs> at a certain point. Yeah. Yeah, because he looks down and he sees Karen's place card holder on her plate and he realizes what – and then he figures out what she's doing, that she must have gone yeah. to see Wilson Fisk. My number two is is very close to that. It, it's that – it's the fact that Karen does go to see Fisk there and she convinces the FBI agents to call his lawyers and with what she's saying, she convinces them to let her in to talk to Fisk and the FBI says, well, we're watching you. But I realized after I watched it, as I kind of fast forward and looked at this the second yeah. time, that they were watching, but they couldn't hear. I guess there's no there's no sound capability. So at first I thought when they broke in there, you know, because she confesses to Wilson Fisk that she killed John Wesley. And she says she shot him seven times because that was all the bullets that she had. And you can see D'Onofrio, and he plays it so well. You, you see him getting, you know, he's hyperventilating. He's getting ready to attack her, and he's he's breathing heavy. And it, it just a really intense scene. But I didn't get what was her intention because even Foggy couldn't understand. You know, did did you want him to attack you? Do you did you want him to to kill you in front of the FBI agents? And then okay, now he's he's committed a crime. What was it? It was a little confusing to me it, it looked to me that. like she wanted him to attack, to her, attack her so that way yeah. she has something and it would put him back in prison yeah i and, guess that's the only thing i could, I know, could just think to of. get him away so he doesn't have all this power and his little private little uh you know hideaway yeah. in his little tower and have his own yeah. world so where he was in yeah. prison before where the prisoners were basically attacking him. So she wants him in, you know, harm's way in a certain. Well, no, she just wants him out. She just wants him out, out of the picture. Yeah, she just wants him back in prison. She wants him back yeah. in prison, you know, because the, the, it just, it, it, the whole thing was a little confusing, but it, it also made sense because that was the whole point. She said, if he commits a crime, we can get him back yeah. in jail. So, so I, I kind of get it, but it was, it was a little confusing when the FBI broke in and they kind of put cuffs on yeah, her. Yeah, it was a little extreme and, because, you know, she was basically yeah, and, in, and, <laughs> antagonizing him to the point where yeah. she wanted him to do something and he just wouldn't. <laughs> It was kind of funny, too, though, that Foggy, when she's released, Foggy goes, you know, you should kind of take it as a compliment. And she's like, what do you mean? That they thought I would actually try to kill him? <laughs> you know, Because that's what obviously that's what Foggy must have told them was that she was going to try to kill Fisk. And so that's why yeah. they broke in there. But, yeah, it was just really uh, it's just a really intense scene. So 
Uh, that would lead me to my number one, which I think you and I both are on the same page with this one. Basically, with Sister Maggie, while Matt is working out, he's below, and she's above, and she's praying. And he hears her, and she's just praying to Matt's father, and states, you know, uh, this is our son. Our yeah. son, yeah. And yeah, it, that's crazy, because, I mean, I guess if I look back on it, we haven't actually seen his mother. No. So I guess it's, it's, it's possible, and it, it, did, it did make a question in my head, though, of do you think... Wouldn't she know that Matt could hear her? I don't think she realized that yeah, okay. that was going I, on. I, I, but the thing was, is that uh, I saw this coming a while ago, just basically of how she was, you know, you, you kept saying how, no, she's just, you know, she's in charge of him. She was there when he was a kid, just who she was. I just saw all that parental you know, that that feeling of not judging, but, hey, this is what you need to do. And, hey, oh, you're going to give me this garbage. I'm going to throw this garbage back at you, and I need you to listen. And, you know, and I think this stemmed with her praying and everything came from the idea of, in the very beginning, when she felt like she dropped the ball and saying, hey, uh, you should get your friends involved because they care for you and they love you, meaning that, in her case, she couldn't really say to him, I'm your mother and I want to help you, but I'm trying my best. But I don't really know you in major respects. You know, I do know you, but not that well. Yeah, no, it, it explains a lot. It explains exactly why she was so she was so willing to take him in, so willing to take care of him there in the first episode, willing to let him stay there. It, it, it makes perfect yeah. sense. You know, it's just one of those things I didn't see it coming. It, it was I just assumed she had this special bond with him. But uh, but yeah, I mean, to find out, I hope we get with five episodes left. I hope we get some of this backstory to explain yeah. to us, you know, why she left his dad, why she never told him growing True. up. Why? Yeah, because she left know, the order they're, they're, for a while. And then she came back. And I think right, that right. when and she we know came that back, she I think that. that was when she had Matt, after she had Matt, and then she came back to the order because she felt she could Right. That's what I'm saying is I want us to I want to get that yeah. story. I understand we can speculate. We can speculate all day long <laughs> about how and what the order of events was. I want them to actually show it to us. I don't want them to tell it to us. I, I'd love for that. Now, if they don't, they don't. But it just it just goes back to that that same thing. I really it's an interesting you know twist to the to the season. And uh, like I said, it makes some explanation of why she did some of the things she did and why she felt the way she felt. Yeah. So. So we <laughs> had a couple of quotes here, and we've already talked about uh, one, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do my first one, which is what we already talked about with Foggy, is that uh, when, he, when, <laughs> when he's talking about how he figured out Wilson Fisk's plan, he says, uh, I discovered this while looking into Marcy's briefs, <laughs> more ways than one. <laughs> and, uh, and Karen kind of goes, Foggy, ew, you know, she kind of does the whole kind of sister kind of yeah, thing, ew, yeah. I don't want to hear about that, you know, so I thought that was, that was pretty that funny. That was pretty funny. I only had one. Basically, that was uh, Dex and Julie when they were in uh, the coffee house and they were talking and she asks him about, you know, his thing with the FBI, what happened. And he goes, uh, the borough needed a scapegoat. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of lighthearted yeah. and it was it, it kind of made her chuckle a little bit, but it kept her at ease. But it, it showed him trying to be a little bit kind of normal in some respect. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, my only other quote was when, when we talked about about the safe cracking that when Nadim when he's when Dar when Matt starts opening the safe, uh, Nadim says, "What you can do that?" And he says, "Not if you keep uh, talking." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, thought, I thought that was a, a great, I chuckled both times when I when I yeah, heard I that. Yeah, I got a good chuckle. Out um, of that one. So we've got a couple of notes here, some different things. Sure. I'll go with my, my, we already talked about my first sure. one, so I'll do my second one, which is just uh, Nadim when he's in the car and he's trying to dress his wound and he calls home and he's kind of talking to his wife. And I, I thought that was interesting because he calls his wife. He says, no, I, you know, he gives her this, he lies to her, tells her that he won't be home. And then he calls his boss and he says, we, we need to talk. And then the very next scene is where we see Fisk 
with Dex and Dex telling him Nadim knows about me and Fisk says, yes, I already know. We need to figure out what to do about this. So it, again, it just shows us that either Fisk has a, a, a tap on the, the boss's phone which now is starting now I'm starting to think maybe that's what it is maybe he just has surveillance in in the FBI offices he doesn't necessarily need somebody to be getting him this information if he's getting it because he's you know tapped their phones yeah. or whatever yeah that that'd be interesting to find out uh, and my only other note uh was you know it was one of those things that in fact just the other morning the the smoke alarms go off in my apartment like at the slightest thing you know, the smoke alarms are going to go off. The, the the fire alarms are going to go off in my apartment. This guy sets fire to a trash can on top of a table in his kitchen. Nothing, nothing. And then he just walks out, apparently, because we didn't actually see him put the fire out. The guy comes to his door, you know. So I'm wondering if the next the next episode, we're going to see his apartment, comp, you know, his apartment building burned down. No, or no, no, no. Maybe this, this truck's <laughs> up to New York and it's like, uh, yeah, not everything's up to code. And they haven't replaced those fire alarms. They're he was probably in a really bad. nice apartment. Yeah, who knows? They they probably haven't changed them in twenty years. Could be. <laughs> or Could the batteries. Be. It just it just it just was one of those things. That I just kind of went man, and then he just I guess then he just walks out. The guy comes to the door and says, "We need to talk," or, or yeah. whatever, and he just leaves the apartment. And I'm like, "Isn't there a trash can burning in his and apartment? Can't you smell it? You know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I I just I I just thought that was it weird, is weird. So. <laughs> Glad you picked that up. Uh, mine would be uh, uh, one of them would be Dex cleaning up his place a in the beginning of the actual episode as he's listening listening to the actual therapist tapes and he's still in the costume as he's doing this with the headphones and he's really strange that's for sure <laughs> the, yeah he's trying but yet there's something going on there yeah. And then uh, in the coffee shop, when he talks to Julie, there's an actual guy reading the newspaper in the coffee shop that's next to them. And you could see it from in the background, but I really couldn't read the front page, but it had the daredevil on the front page. It was pretty much what was, you know, about what was going on and that attack that happened. I wish they focused in on it so I could get a good view of it, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Good catch. So... Basically, so far, I'm I'm enjoying the show uh, for season three. I think it's great, but there's so much going on within the journey of all the characters that you know you knew that this was sparking for a fourth season. Yeah, it just it just brings us back to that what we said. I think almost every every episode, every episode so, so far, far yeah, is, is it's just it's just unfortunate that we didn't get a season four out of this because there's so much they could have done with these characters you know i'm more and more leaning toward this is going to end either this is going to end with them all getting back together and us you know thinking that they're going to go forward or it, it may even end in some sort of a cliffhanger that we don't ever get a, a resolution for so i'm prepared for that if it happens um it's gonna be yeah. unfortunate but you know it's, it is what it is or it Maybe if Marvel picks up Charlie Cox as Daredevil and he shows up yeah. in a Spider-Man movie, that would yeah. be awesome. And be like, oh, okay, here he is. Yeah, I had to redeem myself and blah, blah, blah. Here's my short story. Okay. And then there we go on. Yeah. But uh, we'll find out, hopefully, one day. But, uh, yeah, that that's pretty much it for the, uh, the two episodes that we got. And... On to a little bit of comic talk. So, nothing new in the comics. There's a lot going on in comics. I haven't barely been reading. I've been busy lately. Work's been crazy. But I do keep my ear and my eyes open to what's going on currently. And Superman Red Sun has come out on digital download recently. So, I've already mentioned this in the past. This is a version of Superman who landed as a child in Russia or the old Soviet Union, because I think this takes place in the 80s or 70s at this point, but way back when. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he is brought up in Russia hmm. and is brought up to protect Mother Russia at that point. You know, the Soviet Union. Uh, a different take on the Superman story. I recommend recommend everybody check it out if you're interested in it there is a kind of visual comic that they have on youtube of it but this is the animated version and it's pretty much almost like the old superman cartoons you used to see from the uh i think that from the 30s or 40s i'm not sure the colorized 
it, it's got that nuance to it, the way they, they animate it, and the animation really looks good. Very similar to almost like how they did the Batman in, in the 90s. Cool. The Batman, the animated series. It has that kind of tone and cool. look to it. So I recommend that to everybody. Very cool. Uh, I only have a, my podcast recommendations this week are uh, Strange Indeed on the Podcast Network. They're covering Lock and Key from Netflix. And then, of course, as we talk about every week, the Star Trek Picard cast, which is on Talk Through Media. Check those out. Yeah, they're awesome. So, uh, yeah, I, I definitely high, highly recommend the Picard cast. And I do recommend uh, the language of bromance with uh, Sean and Richard. Uh, I always I, I just listened to the one of them recently this week, and I was laughing. I couldn't stop laughing in the car, so I recommend them. All right. Well, I guess uh, let everybody know that uh, you can hear us on Spotify, Google Play, and Apple iTunes, whatever podcast player of choice uh, you use. If that podcast player of choice lets you give us a review we would love for you to give us a five-star review or whatever it is on on whatever platform we'd love to to hear from you you can check us out on facebook at facebook.com slash panels to pixels we have a website which is panels to pixels podcast.com we also have an email address where you can link up and talk to us there you can send us an email send us a voicemail whatever you want to panels to pixels one at gmail.com that's panels to pixels one the T-O is spelled out right there in the middle, and the number one at gmail.com. You can also call us and send us a voicemail at 845-350-2095. We do ask if you use that number, make sure you mention that you are calling for the Panels to Pixels podcast so we can identify which, uh, which show you're calling about. Again, that number is 845-350-2095. And finally, if you like YouTube... I don't spend a lot of time on YouTube, I will admit. But if you like YouTube, you can also catch our episodes there as well. In fact, I think they posted YouTube first before anything else. And that is just Panels to Pixels podcast on YouTube. So check us out. Yeah, check that out and check out a couple of our friends that are out there. I would say the Grim Life Collective. Go check them out. I recommend them highly. They talk about... A lot of spooky things, and Michael and Jessica went to Hollywood recently and went to a bunch of movie sets where they filmed filming locations, so I, I would highly recommend you guys check them out as well. They did something recently where they went to where they filmed Roger Rabbit as well as Back to the Future, the tunnel scenes and everything where they go in, so I, I found that very, very interesting, and they're very nice people. So I recommend check them out, give them a thumbs up, and subscribe if you're interested. So, you know, listeners, you could hear us other places. So I'm a co-host on The Walking Dead Talk Through with Brian Malosh on Talk Through Media. And with that podcast, we review The Walking Dead each week. This show, Panels to Pixels, will stay on the Next Level Podcast Network. But there will be always a link on our Facebook page for Talk Through Media. And actually, we will, when the new episodes, like for Picard, The Walking Dead Talk Through, or when we do Fear the Walking Dead talk through come up, we will post them on the Facebook as a link so you could follow that. Or you could just subscribe to where they are. You can listen to talkthroughmedia.com and get the podcasts there. Or you could go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We are currently working on a lot of things. There's another podcast in the works between Kyle McAdams and I. So keep in touch here or go to talkthroughmedia.com's website. Very cool. And you can hear me, hear me here, of course, or you can listen, hear my voice on various other podcasts that I submit voicemails to. Yeah, you could hear him a lot. <laughs> I love hearing Steve's voice on other podcasts. It's so fun, especially when he gets on uh, Walking Dead Talk there, because he sends a lot of feedback there, too. You guys do a great job, too. Thank you. So, well, that's our show for this evening. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm Mark, and we will see you on the next panel. And I'm Steve. Talk to you later. And good night.